All right, over Thank to you, you Randy. Thank you very much. I will uh, just start sharing my screen here. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, hopefully you can see that. We'll go to. Yep, all good. Presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, all. Um, so uh, my presentation is around EKF source switching, um, which is really uh, the new features that we've added into EKF three, um, which can be used for you know various purposes, uh, but primarily it's used for uh, transitioning between GPS and non-GPS environments. So here's a little agenda of, um, oops, just want to move this out of the way here. Um, little agenda of the talk, uh, so you know what's coming up. Uh, so yeah, we, first of all, just a couple of example videos, then I'll go through the setup and testing so in case you want to get this uh, working yourself. Then I'll dive into a little bit of detail on, uh, on how it works, you know, what uh, EKF changes uh, we made, um, also the scripts that we use and, and how they decide uh, which, which source to use. Um, and then a little bit of detail on alignment and resets, which makes the transition smooth. And then finally, a simulation and some of the uh, future plans and improvements that we are thinking about. Of course, just jump in any time. If you've got a question, just unmute and ask questions. Um, so first off is a video of Rover. And uh, this is my garage, in case it matters. And this is the Ion Robotics uh, rover. It's got a couple of GPSs and wheel encoders on it. And that's what it's, it's going to be using both. And inside of my garage, I actually do get a GPS lock, but it's not very good. So um, what you'll see in this, uh, in this video is it, is it transitions between the use of wheel encoders um, and heading and GPS uh, for its position estimation. Um, I guess I should also say that uh, the way that you can tell which sensor it's using is by a beep. So if it beeps once, it's using uh, GPS. If it beeps twice, then it's uh, using wheel encoders. So it starts off using wheel encoders. It has chosen wheel encoders automatically. Arm. It's a very simple back and forth mission. It's just two waypoints. This gives the GPS. Here's the waypoints. We'll turn around and come home. All right, so that's the uh, first example using uh, wheel encoders and GPS. The next one is a uh, multi-copter. Now this actually uh, was taken before the uh, Rover video that we just saw. This is actually uh, middle of, uh, of last year. So at this point, we didn't have the automatic switching between sources. So I'm going to be in this video, I'm uh, manually switching between GPS and uh, an Intel T265 uh, 3D camera. Uh, but I just want to you know, make sure it's clear that the automatic switching does work in, in Copter as well now. So. so here it is uh, taking off and loiter with a GPS. This is my regular Cube Pilot. Uh, quad with the uh, tail camera on the front and the GPS sticking up. Then I've just switched it manually using an RC switch on the transmitter to switch it over to the camera. And I fly it under this uh, you know, concrete um, canopy and I'm rotating it with the yaw stick. And just, you can just see how, how stable the position is you wouldn't get that kind of stability with the GPS underneath that canopy. And I fly back out and switch it back to GPS again. 
so yeah, the, I guess the, you know, the key points here uh, to look out for is that, uh, you know, the vehicle is stable, even with that GPS, um, and also that the transitions are very smooth. So, you know, if I didn't, I think, you know, if I didn't tell you that it was switching sensor sources, you wouldn't have noticed, you wouldn't have seen a twitch or anything like that. And those are the key challenges of this project. Oops, we don't need that. Okay, so the next, I just want to go over the setup in case you want to uh, set this up yourself. So uh, you need to use um, RJ Pilot 4.1 or higher. Uh, any of the vehicles should work. So I've used Copter and Rover, but you know, presumably plane would also work um, or submarine or whatever. You need to use the EKF3. So that's enabled by default on 4.1. So you shouldn't have to do anything, but you know, just in case. Uh, the two parameters you have to set are the EK3 enable and AHRS EKF type. Set those. Um, you also should have made sure that the, uh, you know, two or three sources that you're going to use work. So, you know, follow the instructions on the wiki for, for example, setting up the wheel encoders or the Intel TC65 camera. You know, you have to follow all those instructions to, you know, to make sure that those, those work. So then uh, next, Inside the EKF, we've added this new APNAV EKF source um, object, and it allows you to set up three sets of sources. Um, so, um, you know, each source um, would be used for like a different environment. So, for, for example, the first set of sources um, would normally be set up to use GPS. It, you know, it's totally arbitrary, but, you know, the way I've been doing it, the first set is always the set that uses GPS. So you say that you know, the first sensor set is going to be using GPS for its horizontal position. So source one, pause X, Y, set to three for GPS. Same for velocity, horizontal velocity is GPS. Uh, for vertical position, you might use barometer, which is one. Um, for vertical velocity, again, GPS. And then for heading, we use the compass. So that's your first set. Then uh, for your non-GPS environment, normally it's set up the secondary set to use, for example, uh, horizontal position, velocity uh, from the external nav system, which is, you know, uh, you know, the SLAM or the Intel T265. Um, you could get the vertical position as well from, from the camera, but actually it's sort of a bit of a special case with the Intel cameras. They're quite sensitive to uh, vibration. So if any axis goes wrong, it's usually the, the vertical axis that goes wrong. So for that reason, um, in my tests, I've very often uh, been sticking with the barometer um, with a, a rangefinder as well to help keep the, the altitude above terrain um, stable. And then for the uh, yaw, I, I've test, tested both ways. You can set it up so that, you know, source two yaw is the camera or the compass. Either one works. Um, you can take your pick. I often use the compass though. So. Uh, also, by the way, just, um, you know, at the end, of, at the bottom of each one of these slides, you'll see a link to uh, an appropriate page on the wiki. So, you know, in case, um, you know, there's more details on the wiki there that you might want to might want to check out. So right. So yeah, just to clarify, you set up these different uh, sets. You don't specifically, you know, um, we don't dynamically, for example, you know, change you know the, the first position source between camera and GPS. We don't do it like that. You set up different sets and then you switch between the sets. And the way that you switch between the sets. Well, there's a couple of different ways, but you can do it manually by setting up a, um, an auxiliary switch. So for example, um, on my transmitter, I have a little turning knob on channel six. So I set that up as my EKF position source, which is 90. So I set RC6 option to 90. And so the low position um, selects GPS, the middle position selects uh, the camera. And um, in some of my tests, I had a, a third position, which was actually optical flow. So that allows the manual switching. For automatic switching, we do that via Lua scripts. So uh, we set up, um, I'll jump into the, the Lua script details later, but um, you set up RC7 option as 300, which is you know, uh, an option reserved for scripting. And then the script will go in there and check what the position of your you know, um, auxiliary switch seven is. So if it's low, uh, the, the script doesn't do anything. If you pull it high, the, the script starts automatically selecting which, uh, which source set um, should be used based upon various, um, you know, based upon the, the status of the EKF and also, you know, some 
feedback directly from the sensors. Um, also, if you're using external NAV, uh, like Intel uh, T265, um, you might want to set up uh, a third auxiliary switch to be 80, which is for the uh, Bizo align. It means uh, realigning the yaw of the camera to match the HRS. So these, these cameras, you know, their, their heading is a bit arbitrary. So you know, if you point it south, south and then power up the, the camera, it will think that zero is south. So um, to allow you to realign the, the yaw of the camera with, say, for example, a compass, you might want to use this, uh, well, this RC, um, RC option 80 uh, does that alignment. So you can manually align them. It will also actually align them at startup. So um, you might not need to have manual uh, realignment, but um, in my, in my um, development, I've always had that switch available. And you know, after a longer flight, I've realigned them. So the next thing you, do, you need to do is actually install one of the Lua scripts. If, if you want automatic switching between senses, or sorry, uh, between sources, you need to um, use a Lua script. So I've built, or I've written two. Uh, one of them is called ahrssource.lua, and the other one is ahrssource GPS wheel encoders. And you can imagine the difference, perhaps. The HRS, uh source GPS wheel encoders is, of course, for vehicles with GPS and wheel encoders, like the rover I showed in the first video. The HRS, HRS source uh, that Lewis script was actually for the multi-copter, and that supports, um, that's for use with GPS, um, external nav, i.e. TT65, and optical flow, those three, those three sources. Then what you do is you may need to manually adjust some of the thresholds that the scripts use for deciding which, which uh, sensor set to use. So these are all a bit arbitrary, but these particular scripts use these three parameters. Um, the SCR user one is used for the rangefinder threshold. So below the, the rangefinder threshold, uh, it may use optical flow. It certainly will not use optical flow if it's above that rangefinder. Uh, the next one is for the GPS accuracy threshold. And uh, so this is the speed accuracy. I should be clear on that. Um, this is actually, you know, during, during the development um, and testing, we tried various uh, different um, outputs of the GPS as the basis for making the decision. We tried, you know, HDOP, satellite count, um, a bunch of things. But after a talk with Paul, um, we, uh, we tried at the speed accuracy, and this was by far the, the best. Um, so we found that a value of 0 0.3 works well, somewhere in that range. And then the last parameter, uh, SCR user three, this is for the external nav vertical velocity innovation threshold. So uh, coincidentally, this number is also 0 0.3. What that means is that um, we're, we're going to be uh, using the external nav potentially if, it's, um, if the sensor data agrees with the EKF estimates for vertical velocity within 0 0.3 meters per second. So those are the three criteria that we use to, to do the switching. Um, so after you've got that all set up, um, you should definitely test it. Don't just go straight into um, you know, automatic switching. Um, you know, take a couple of uh, easier steps before you do that. So for example, um, first manually control the, the switching of the, of the sources uh, using the auxiliary, um, auxiliary switch and test fly the vehicle in the GPS and the non-GPS environments and make sure that it's flying well in each. Uh, sometimes, for example, when you're using the 2265, you run into problems with high vibration um, or you, know, you might have the, um, you know, the camera, the camera's um, heading might not align with the compass and you set up the sources to use the compass as the heading and then you'll get these you know, toilet bowling or worse. So again, yeah, just make sure that you've manually, fl manually flown it in both the GPS and the non-GPS environments and make sure that it works. Then what you do is you enable the automatic switching and then manually carry the vehicle from one environment to the next and just make sure that those thresholds that you've set up are working properly. You know, you should find that it switches within two seconds. Um, if it doesn't, then, you know, maybe those thresholds need some, some modification. And then finally, after that, 
uh, try, uh, you know, driving or, or flying it between the two environments in a you know, semi-manual mode like, or semi-autonomous mode like loiter, uh, just to confirm that the transitions are smooth and be ready to take back control in um, either stabilize or alt hold. Um, I, normally I, I would switch back to alt hold, but if for example, you're using the T265 and you've got, and especially if you're using it for the vertical uh, position, you know, if that camera goes nuts, um, you know, again, normally because of vibration, uh, switching to alt hold is, may not save the vehicle because it might rock it into the sky. So in those cases, you know, get ready to take over in stabilized mode. Is that, is that clear? Cool, I'll move on then. I have one question, Randy. Sure. How are you setting home um, when you're starting, like for example, with encoders and then you switch to the GPS mode? Great, thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, the ECAP has been slightly changed. Um, you can, so there's a couple different ways to do it. Uh, one is that you can just, you know, arm and take off outside and then move inside, uh, or you can, you know, bring the vehicle outside uh, switch the source to GPS and, and let it set its home out there. Um, and then move, move the vehicle back in into the non-GPS environment. That's, that's the easiest way. The other way that you can do it is you, you know, if you're, that's not an option, uh, you can of course start the vehicle up in, uh, you know, in, with the non-GPS uh, source set. And then you can actually right mouse button click on the, on the map and, and tell uh, RG Pilot where it is. And then the EKF origin and the home will both be set to that, that location. Um, but what happens then when you move out and if you set it up, like if you set the home yeah. wrong and then you go out? <clears throat> yes, this is a very good point. This actually comes up on the very next slide, I think, um, as one of the known issues, uh, because you, you may find, um, and in fact, I did actually find in, you know, some of the testing, especially with Rover, um, if you set the home indoors and it's off from reality, and then you move outside, and then you, 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 know, you get the real position according to the GPS, it will shift the position and it will essentially shift home. So you know, when the vehicle returns back to the non-GPS environment, you know, maybe, to, you know, maybe to RTL home and land, it can end up um, landing at a different position than it took off from. And that's because of the, uh, the way that we handle the transitions and the offsets between the two. So far, I don't know of any, any solution to that problem. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. We can talk about it a little bit more uh, later, maybe too. It really depends a little bit upon the, um, I think, you know, the solution could depend upon the, uh, the SLAM system that you're using. So um, if it's perhaps um, Google Cartographer, which, which keeps a 3D map in memory, and, you know, when it comes back to a known environment, it will reset itself. Um, you know, we, we could perhaps deal with that differently than if we're using the T265, where it doesn't really maintain a full 3D map. You know, if it goes outside and loses its position estimate and then comes back inside, it doesn't recognize again, oh, I'm, I'm back where I, where I started, it, it won't. So yeah, we might have to have different solutions for different systems. There's a couple of other questions uh, in the chat. Sure. Uh, can it be switched via Mavlink? That is also on an upcoming slide. That is in the um, future enhancements area. Uh, so um, we cannot uh, change it. We cannot change the source set by Mavlink, but it's not a difficult uh, change to make, not a, not a difficult enhancement to do. So I, I suspect we'll do that in the nearest future. Um, actually, it doesn't, it's an RC channel option to switch them, isn't it? Uh, it can be an RC option, yes. Well, yeah, we actually one of the do ways. it in Pretty sure we merged that thing in master, which allows you to trigger RC channel options via Mavlink. So it might actually work now. Okay, cool. Hmm. Uh, second question was, does it align with a your reset? Uh, yes, it does. Yes. So yeah, one of the difficult parts of the of the project was handling all of the uh, the resets. So position, velocity, and yaw resets. Um, it, it does capture those, does catch those and, um, uh, and, and deal with them as, you know, almost as well as we could. There are still a couple of enhancements that we could do, um, but mostly it handles those. And the 
last one here was, can we use dead reckoning until we get GPS? Um, can we use dead reckoning until we get GPS? So I'm not sure I totally understand what that means, but you know, I guess one common question that we get is, you know, can we fly with IMUs only um, if we lose GPS or if we lose any, any position source, whether that's, um, you know, a slam camera or, or, or beacons or what have you. Uh, and the answer is always just that, you know, with the uh, quality of IMUs that we have on most autopilots, uh, you know, which are very similar to the, the IMUs that you have in, in, in uh, your uh, cell phones, uh, your smartphones, uh, you know, the, the drift is so high that um, we very quickly get a massive uh, velocity and then, um, you know, uh, you know, a very quick position move, or sorry, the position starts, position estimate starts drifting off uh, very rapidly. So you have really have less than 10 seconds or so before, um, before you have an unusable velocity and position. So yeah, I am use alone, if that's the question, I am use alone are just not enough. We need to have some kind of absolute or local uh, position source. All right. Thank you. I guess maybe the question was a little different. Um, right, so like you could say, well, I've got a GPS now and I travel 10 meters, so home is 10 meters back that way. Uh, yeah, I, I think essentially, if I understand the question, I think that essentially that is what it, what it does. So let, let's, let's uh, cover that a little bit more when we get to the transition section uh, later in the talk. Okay, so next I'd like to dive in a little bit to the uh, EKF changes. Now, um, oh, um, um, Randy, I have, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, um, how does uh, optical flow, like just standalone optical flow um, come into play at all on this? So- or, or does it? It does, um, it does. So, um, you know, optical flow provides uh, not an absolute position, it provides a, essentially a horizontal velocity. Uh, so, but you can integrate that velocity to come up with a, with a position estimate and, um, you know, getting back to the previous question about using IMUs only, optical flow velocities are enough to keep the, the drift uh, and noise from the IMUs under control uh, for the most part. So uh, at least for, you know, if we're talking about time periods of, you know, a couple of minutes or so, the optical flows, you know, can give you a good position estimate. And, um, you know, in terms of this, you know, wider uh, feature of, you know, GPS and non-GPS, um, it, it will work with optical flow and, and GPS only. Like you don't need to have a fancy camera for this, for this feature to be useful. Is that, is that even close to answering your question there, Tom? Yeah, I'm just picturing for the, uh, for a fixed wing version where if you have um, a GPS going in and out, because um, normally you, you'd rely, uh, rely on the dead reckoning. But I'm just wondering if, if any of these settings actually would help if you had, um, you know, optical flow. If, if it doesn't enhance that, absolutely. So you can you can definitely set up these sources um, so that you're switching between GPS and optical flow. That'll that'll definitely work. And you could um, you know write a little Lua script, which then looks at you know maybe the GPS quality or you know even the status of the GPS. And if you lose your GPS. Um, you, you change the source over use optical flow instead. And I think the EKF would, would deal with that. It would stop looking at trying to fuse, well, it would stop trying to G, fuse the GPS data and only try and fuse the optical flow. So that, that could work. And just do uh, it, in it low enough. Now, in the event of optical flow, it, it, it does move back to a GPS if you do get that. I'm not sure if I followed that on, the, on, on your talk. So uh, for source one, source two, like how, how well does it switch back? Well, yeah, again, it, it, you, well, it depends upon how how well the Lua script is written. Um, so the, the Lua scripts that I've written so far, um, one of them, which does include, you know, switching between GPS, T265 and optical flow, um, it, it does have some decision-making trying to decide, you know, which one is best and it'll switch in either direction. It doesn't just go, you know, just from non-GPS to GPS and never back again. It'll, it'll switch back and forth, um, you know, depending upon a bunch of criteria. So I'm, I'm sure you could write a Lua script, which would, which would intelligently switch between GPS and optical flow. And you can gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank that. you. There's also actually I didn't mention it um, on this on this slide, but you can also 
um, blend both GPS and optical flow at the same time. You know, that, that's a feature that's, that's been in EKF for a very long time. Uh, Paul added that and demonstrated that at a, at a developer conference a few years ago where he was flying a copter underneath a tree. That all still works. Uh, there is an EK3 source options uh, bit mask parameter. And one of the options in that is uh, fuse all velocities that are in any source set. So, um, so what you do is uh, you set up, you know, your regular GPS source set, and then you set up a second one, which, which has optical flow listed as the, you know, velocity X, Y source, and then check that, um, that option bit. And then it'll, it'll fuse not only GPS velocities, but also optical flow velocities, you know, whenever they're available. Is that okay? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, next is just uh, diving into the EKF a little bit. Now, a uh, little disclaimer. Obviously, I'm not the EKF expert. Um, you know, both Tridge and, of course, Paul uh, know a lot more about the EKF than I do. But um, I learned a lot about the EKF uh, as part of this project. And I just wanted to pass along some of um, my increased understanding of EKF. But these slides have not been run by Paul, so you can probably point out a bunch of things that are wrong with it. But my, my simplified view of EKF is, is on these slides. And um, I hope that it helps other people, um, other developers uh, who maybe are hesitant about you know, jumping into EKF because they're worried about all the you know, complexity. You know, it seems like the, the scariest, most complex system that we you know, part of the part of RDPOT. But that's true. But there's also parts of it which are very understandable. So I'm hoping that um, you know, more developers will um, will get involved with EKF uh, development because it's not as bad as, as you might think. So uh, with that disclaimer uh, put to the side, um, I think the EKF has like three, at least three uh, components. Um, so it has this interface, you know, component at the top here and in orange, which we're all familiar with. This is, you know, where you get your, you know, your attitude or your position or whatever. So that's, that's really quite easy and, and, and everybody understands that part. But then there's this uh, measurement section. And um, this is where we take in all of the sensor data and we push it into little buffers. So we have IMU buffer, GPS buffer, external nav buffer, barometer buffer. Um, you have all these little buffers uh, that, we, that we push the sensor data into, or sometimes we pull data from the sensor into these buffers. But in any case, the sensor data ends up in these, uh, these buffers. And um, you can actually see how, you know, there's a little link here, this little C code link. You can just have a little peek at that if you want. Um, and uh, you'll see that it's not, not too bad. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I'm actually gonna click on it and show you. So for example, this is the right, this is probably very small. Maybe that's a little more visible. Right external nav data. So this is what gets called by the AP Visual Odometry Library to push position, attitude, uh, and and um, expected error data into the EKF. And right, so a bunch of vector three Fs come in. We do a little bit of checking of the timestamps to make sure that they're not too close to the last timestamp, so we don't get you know an overflow of data. And uh, we add a little. We do a couple little things, but eventually we just push it into a buffer right here. So it's really, it's really not too, that part is not too scary. Then, um, right, you might ask, you know, why do, we, why do we have these buffers in the first place? What's their purpose? And this is really just to deal with the uh, varying lag between sensors. So uh, GPS, you know, tends to have quite a long lag. IMU has incredibly short lag. The barometer uh, is sort of somewhere in the middle. And then finally, there's this fusion step. And this is the really complex part. And I don't understand all of this. Um, but I guess I understood it enough to add in uh, this little layer here, which is the source selection object that I mentioned before. This is the one, this is the object that has those, you know, parameters that I talked about earlier. And previously, you know, um, on every iteration, the, the EKF would, would you know, uh, come through and it would check if there's any data from any of the sensors which are at or before the delayed time horizon. It would check for any data and then it would start fusing them in. What we've done here is we've added in a little check. So it just, be, you know, it still, you know, pulls the data in from the GPS on, you know, um, if there's any data there. 
it definitely pulls it in. Um, but then before it goes to fuse it, it just checks with the source selection. Hey, is my active um, horizontal position source the GPS? If yes, then it'll fuse it as per normal. If not, it'll just ignore it, basically just throw it away. Uh, the other thing it does is it checks um, if the source has changed. So if on the previous iteration, the source was external nav and this um, iteration it is a GPS, then it triggers a reset. So you'll see it sets a reset flag um, if, if the source changes. And again, there's a link to the code there if you wanna have a peek. Uh, and finally, the last change that we made is on the calculation of the innovations. So um, the innovations are a useful input to the Lewis scripts decision-making as to which source is best. So even though we might be ignoring the GPS data right now, we still want to know, you know how closely the GPS sensor data is, is matching our estimate. Um, so even though we, we don't fuse every single source, we still want to calculate the innovation for every single source. Is that clear? Cool. And just as a side note, um, the EKF has these two time horizons. Uh, there's two times that it deals with. There's the delay time horizon, which is sort of in the past. That's the, that is in general, the uh, now minus the longest, uh, the, the most laggy sensor is lag time. So like it might be you know, 0.2 seconds or something like that. So that's EKF is fusing data in the past. And then what it does is it projects forward. So it, it takes that you know, delayed estimate and then it um, essentially sort of extrapolates forward using the, uh, the IMU data, which we've collected up between that old time and now. That's a bit of a side, side there. Doesn't really matter too much in terms of this project. Okay, moving on. Okay, next is pretty simple stuff actually. This, is, uh, this slide covers how the scripts make the decision between which source to use. So the more complex script is this you know, AHRS source Lua script and it has to, it has to uh, decide between the three sources, GPS, external nav and optical flow. And the way it does that um, is it, it breaks the decision into two. So first it's a GPS versus non-GPS, and then it's gonna be deciding, if it's non-GPS, GPS is gonna be deciding, should it be external nav or optical flow? So it, it does, it has two votes, basically. So on every iteration, it's voting at these two different levels. And uh, it, it updates the, these vote counts at 10 Hertz. So each time it will make a vote, you know, uh, plus one to GPS, um, plus one to optical flow. So it'll be doing these you know, two votes um, on every iteration. And it will switch source if either of these two vote counters reaches 20 in either direction. So essentially sort of cumulative two seconds um, of, of data suggests we should go this way, we'll, we'll switch. So it also means the decision-making will never happen in less than two seconds. Now, um, a little bit of detail about the GPS versus non-GPS vote. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, it'll use the GPS speed accuracy. So if that's good or the GPS is usable, which means that it's basically got a, um, a speed accuracy of less than one and the, and the non-GPS is completely unusable. So for example, on the next one, next line you can see here, you know, is the non-GPS usable or not? It, it checks this. So non-GPS is usable if the external nav uh, vo vertical velocity innovations are less than or equal to 0 0.3, then that means the, the camera or the external nav is usable. Or if the range finder is low, if we're below that range finder threshold, then the, again, the non-GPS is usable. So if, if neither of those two are true, it's gonna switch to the GPS. Uh, then when it comes down to the external nav versus the optical flow decision, again, it uses the external nav uh, velocity innovations. If they're low, it'll vote towards the external nav. Uh, if they're high and the rangefinder distance is low, then it'll, it'll vote towards the optical flow. So that's actually, that's all the logic that we're using. 
Um, any questions or comments? Anybody want to point out the glaring hole in how we use optical flow? So right now, the optical, you know, you might notice here, it, it's only using the rangefinder. It's not actually checking optical flow, um, you know, velocity innovations. It's not even checking the status of the optical flow. So there's definitely room for improvement here. Is that cool? Well, what you said about the rangefinder on it. Um, what if you know, you're out of range, like on a plane? Yeah, so in this script that I've got, uh, if you're outside of the, if you're you know above that rangefinder um, threshold, it will not use the optical flow at all. It'll it'll leave the source back in the GPS and and try and use it. It doesn't. That doesn't mean that it's going to fuse bad GPS data though, because this whole change is really just turning on and off the faucet for this um, for this data to flow into the EKF. After that, the EKF will still do all of its regular checks upon the data to make sure that it's you know, not too noisy, that the innovations aren't too high and all that kind of, all those regular checks that it would, that it would normally do. It's just sort of turning on and off the faucet. Is that cool? Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll look forward to playing with it. Cool. Um, also, I've talked about, um, innovations a bunch of times. And I just wanted to make sure that people understood what innovations were. I mean, I think I already sort of explained it on the last slide a little bit, but um, here's a little diagram to try and explain it a little bit further. So um, my understanding is that, you know, every iteration, the EKF builds upon the previous iteration. So it, it had a position estimate, an attitude estimate, et cetera. Then it, it adds on to that, uh, the latest IMU data to come up with a new predicted estimate of, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but in particular, you know, for this project, the predicted velocities are the, are the key. So the IMU comes up with these predicted velocities based on the previous estimate plus IMU. And then we have this incoming, um, you know, velocity, say from the external nav system. And the innovation is simply the, dis the difference between that latest velocity from the camera and this estimate. That's it. So pretty simple. Okay, more words. Okay, so this, this is the slide I think which gets back to some of our earlier discussion um, about home moving, et cetera. Uh, this slide is really talking about, yeah, the alignment and the resets, which was you know, a, a difficult part of the a challenging part of this project. So um, we really wanted a smooth transitions. And uh, to get smooth transitions, you need to either avoid any jumps. So you, want to, you need to make sure that the, the, the two sources are, are producing the same numbers or very close numbers. Or if they are jumping, you need to be able to handle those jumps. And we had to do, we had to do both of these things. So to avoid the jumps, um, we've added this align inactive sources method. And again, you can click on it to have a look at it. Um, and this is inside of the new source, you know, APNAV EKF sources um, class. And this is called by the EKF at the end of its fusion step. So after it's come up, it's fused all the data, et cetera, it's just about to exit. Just before it, it exits, it, it calls this, this method. And inside of this method, um, it checks what is the active source. And if, for example, the active source is GPS right now, it will then call over into the visual odometry library, which is used for external lab and say, hey, update yourself to match the HRS. So if the HRS is using GPS right now, it calls over to the external nav basically and says, hey, align yourself to the, to the HRS. So align yourself to the latest EKF estimate. So inside the visual odometry library, it then um, moves its position. So for example, in this little picture here, the external nav is off from the GPS a little bit, it's a little bit rotated as well. It will shift this, its position uh, to match the the HRS, which is based on GPS. Um, it should actually also realign, I think. It should probably realign the yaw at that moment. It doesn't. Um, very simple change. I haven't done it yet, planning to do it, but at the moment it doesn't do that. So uh, right now that yaw alignment is only happening at the, um, when the pilot uh, triggers it using that auxiliary switch. 
Okay. Next one is handling of jumps. So the ECAF and EHRS already um, can tell a caller if there's been any reset in position, velocity, or, or yaw. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these get last something, something, something reset uh, methods inside the HRS in EKF. And it's a timestamp and it'll tell you when was the last reset. So, you know, um, the caller maintains a, a local copy of the last reset time. And if they ever, then on every iteration, they check again and again, you know, has that timestamp change. And if it does, then you do something, you know, resets happen, you have to do something. And then inside of the copter attitude controllers and position controllers, we handle these jumps by moving the target. So this is really Leonard's work, but um, you know, say for example, there's been a position jump like here, you know, in this little diagram here, you know, the, for example, the suddenly the, the copter's position has moved a few meters to the right. Um, we, we move the target. So in this case, the, you know, the, the vehicle was say trying to aim for a target one meter or so ahead of it. Uh, suddenly the whole, you know, vehicle has moved a few meters to the right. So we move the we move the target a few meters to the right as well, and you know it's a small point, but I just like to point out that to avoid a jump, you need the same amount of error before and afterwards. So if you get a position jump, that doesn't mean oh let's move the target to where the new to where the vehicle is now. That's that's not what we want. That would actually cause a twitch. Instead, you just need to make sure that the error before and after the jump is the same. So the vehicle's response is the same. It's, it's heading, or sorry, it's, it's heading, it's attitude is the same before and after the jump. Um, okay, then we get down to a couple of known issues. Um, so if you look closely at the map during one of these transitions, you'll notice that there's a change, a difference in behavior between when you move from non-GPS to GPS or the other way around. So when you're moving from a GPS environment to an external nav environment or non-GPS environment, there's no jump on the map because of all this jump avoidance work that we've done up above. The vehicle just smoothly moves, no jump. But going the other way around, it does jump. So yeah, if you set, your, for example, if, like in the example that Hamey gave earlier, you know, you've, you've set your um, home position slightly off from where the vehicle really was, then you, you fly the vehicle outside, it gets a GPS lock, suddenly it knows exactly where it really is, um, and it will jump a few meters. The, the pilot won't necessarily see it, but uh, on the map, it will jump. And the place where this really uh, causes trouble is if you're doing a mission. So in loiter mode, you don't notice. The vehicle doesn't move, the target was moved, so there's, no, there's nothing, nothing bad happens at all. But in a waypoint mission, it does matter because you're going to a very specific latitude, longitude, and altitude target. So when it when it transitions, uh, you can see the vehicle. You know the vehicle may suddenly, uh, you know, move move left or right or whatever um, a few meters to to get rid of that sudden position error. It shouldn't be a, dr a drastic, crazy, you know, lean over at forty five degree type type response. It's it's sort of the standard. Uh, response that you get to any kind of position error. So it should be a, you know, a gentle controlled uh, shift, but it will definitely shift. And then when you go to RTL later, you might find, as I mentioned earlier, that the vehicle comes back, but it lands away from where it actually took off. So that's a known issue. Um, I don't really have a solution right now. I'm certainly open to suggestions on ways to fix that. Um, just a couple other little uh, known issues. Um, right now, the vehicle, as far as I know, uh, from my investigation, we do not handle velocity resets. Um, and also the EKF doesn't provide an accessor to tell us about vertical velocity resets. So pos vertical position resets, we definitely get told about, um, but we don't, we don't get told about vertical velocity resets. Maybe that's because they always happen at the same time as the position resets, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I think what this means is that you may see a little bit of a jump in altitude when switching between sources. Um, so yeah, I just see a little question here from Alex uh, Burka. So if you are using the example of a T265, which is constantly drifting over time, won't its innovations grow if the faucet is turned off? Yes, okay, great question. So, um, the 
the thing is that we are actually using the velocity innovations, so not the not the position innovations. Um, so yeah, so um, maybe, maybe this is the point here. Maybe this maybe this is here, but. Um, the velocity innovations, you know, even if there's a little bit of drift, the um, the innovations won't grow. You know, they'll be sort of constant. So I think that's it's, it's quite easy to use. I think velocity innovations um, as a as a decider as to which sensor is good or bad. Um, position innovations would not be so good um, for a couple of reasons. One is that we might be constantly getting rid of that uh, position offset. You know, through this avoidance work here. Um, so that, you know, that would essentially negate the value. It would, it would always appear to have a innovation of almost zero. Yeah, so velocity innovations are the ones that we're using. In particular, vertical velocity innovations are very good, especially with the T265, which has these crazy, I'm sorry, I mean, T265 is awesome when it works. It's just got this weakness um, with, with um, vibration, which means that especially the vertical axis can, can go wonky if you're not, if it hasn't been mounted properly. Okay, I guess I'll just move on. Uh, yeah, this is um, just talking a little bit about simulation. Uh, so we also improved the Vicon simulator in SIDL, which allows you to test these transitions quite, quite easily. Uh, there's a wiki page again, of course, which you can refer to if you wanna set this up, um, but it's, it's pretty much the same as setting up a real vehicle. So you set your ViSO type to two, then you set up all of your little sources, um, and you have to set the serial five protocol to Mavlink two. And then when you start sim vehicle, you have to tack on this bit at the end, the minus a, you know, UART F equals sim Vicon. And then that will produce, you know, simulated Vicon, um, which is gonna be constantly feeding in, um, you know, those uh, vision position estimate and vision speed, uh, vision speed estimate messages uh, to RD pilot. And then they'll get consumed in the regular way, um, just like on a real vehicle. Uh, but there's also been a bunch of extra parameters added. Um, so, for example, you can add in a yaw offset, so the, you know you can essentially simulate the you know the, the camera's you know the vehicle's pointing south when it's powered on. So there's a 180 degree um, you know angle offset from the camera, and then you can you know test how that you know how our avoidance um, jump avoidance code uh, deals with that, and et cetera. So yeah, this is very useful. I think you can add glitches in. Bunch of things like that. Okay, and uh, yeah, the um, second to last slide is just about future plans. Um, so, I'd like to uh, fill out the calculation of the velocity innovations a bit more. So, we we simply uh, don't calculate them, or we don't make them available, I should say, to the Lewis scripts for optical flow and wheel encoders. And um, if we had that, it would definitely allow the, the Lewis scripts to be more confident in their, um, in their making of decision, in their decision making. Uh, also, as mentioned earlier, uh, we'd like to uh, add uh, support for the switches to happen via Mavlink commands. Um, also like to build out some more Lewis scripts. So we've just got these two examples. Um, really would like to build a, a GPS plus optical flow example, which I think is probably gonna be maybe the most common um, script that people really would like to use. Uh, we'd like to automatically align the external nav's heading to the HRS when, when, when the external nav is not the active source. So like I said, we, we're only doing that right now via um, an auxiliary switch. We should really do that automatically all the time. It should be a fairly simple change, but. Uh, the next thing too, and this really fits in with the uh, 4.1 uh, beta release that's, that's coming quite soon, um, is more demonstrations and videos of the system working in, with uh, you know, different combinations of sensors and in different situations. So I've seen a couple of examples of other uh, you know, users and developers um, using it successfully, but um, you know, uh, definitely want more, more people testing it out and um, you know, if there's any issues, of course, I'm, I'm on standby to you know, help overcome them. A great place actually to talk about um, this 
this feature is in the vision projects channel in uh, in Discord. That's I'm, you know, I'm usually there, and there's a bunch of other uh, developers there as well uh, with experience of the feature. And then maybe at some point we might we, yeah, sorry we, we might want to transfer some of these uh, logic that's currently in Lewis scripts into C uh, I think it's too early to do that. Uh, I think we're sort of still in the um, in the stage where we're discovering which you know inputs are important. Um, you know, once we're much more confident that you know this is the logic that always works, we can we could transfer that potentially to C plus plus. That would allow it to work on the um, you know, boards with less memory, perhaps, and less CPU power. So that's pretty much it. Uh, last thing, I just want to you know thank um, some of my uh, supporters who helped me with this project. So. Um, Dronability is a company here in Japan, and they were the ones who were really pushing for this uh, feature. So Kitoko-san is their uh, CEO, and he uh, did the project management for this for this project. I've known him for years. Um, he's also on, uh, we do a lot of search and rescue uh, work together as well. Uh, Kawamura-san, uh, he was uh, doing software development of some of the uh, Lewis scripts. And um, he also works, he's a teacher at uh, Drone Japan School here in Japan. Course. And Komiya-san is the uh, guy who worked on the frame and also he was the, the test pilot. So um, yeah, thanks very much to them and also to Eames, uh, who's, my, uh, who's been supporting my efforts for years. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. And you know, um, like I said, if you give this feature a try and if, you know, um, I'd, I'd really love to hear feedback on whether it's worked or not worked or, or what have you. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Randy. That was absolutely brilliant. And it's a fantastic new feature, being able to, uh, to do GPS, non-GPS navigation like that and really nice demo videos. Much appreciated. So um, in the schedule we have up next, um, uh, Patrick uh, uh, Perrier, or better known in our community as Patrick Electric, and he's be talking about Rust Mavlink. Now, um, Patrick, are you about ready to go? Uh, yeah, there you are. I am ready to go. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, I am just going to organize the recordings. Uh,